So in this video, we're going to learn about the polarity of molecules. As a prerequisite to this lesson, it would be a really good idea if you watch the crash course video on polar molecules. And also, you're going to need to know how to predict the three-dimensional shape of molecules themselves, whether polar or not. Um, and so if you don't recall all that, this would be a real good time for you to go back and review how to predict the shape of molecules. Okay, so we're talking about polarity. Now, in order to understand polarity in the way that I explain it anyway, you need to know a couple of uh, symbols, terms that stand, you know the symbols and the terms they stand for and what the terms mean. So we're, here's EN. EN is just a symbol that I use for something called electronegativity. Okay, we defined electronegativity in unit two. And we went through all the periodic table trends. And we said that electronegativity is how hard one atom pulls on the electrons that it shares with another atom. So electronegativity has to do with covalent bonding primarily, okay? Because that's where electrons are shared. If you look in your set of test references that I gave you for doing homework, you will find that there is a periodic table that has electronegativities listed on them. There are several different ways to um, determine electronegativity. It's a relative number. Uh, I think this is called the Lewis electronegativity. Okay, But it's a relative number because it has to do with how hard one atom pulls on the electrons it shares with another. So it's a relative term. That's why there are no units of measurement really that fit with this. Okay, <clears throat> so electronegativity has to do with individual atoms. Now, this is also important because when we're talking about polarity, <clears throat> we're talking about two kinds of polarity. We're talking about the kind of polarity that deals with uh, bonds between two atoms. And, between the, and the kind of polarity that exists in a molecule overall. And that's where this term comes in. This is electronegativity difference. <clears throat> and in math, what does the term difference mean? How do you get a difference? What kind of math operation do you do? It gives the subtraction. That's right. So this is the difference in electronegativity between atoms. Okay? Now, different textbooks, different professors, different people who know this stuff better than I do have different measurement points they come up with for what electronegativity difference is considered nonpolar, what electronegativity difference is considered to be polar, and when do you get into such an extreme electronegativity difference that you have, uh, it's considered uh, ionic. Um, and all of them are valid, and all of them have their shortcomings, because simply stated, electronegativity alone cannot tell you if a molecule or even a bond is polar. There are so many other things that go into it. There are cases sort of in the gray areas where I can have a bond that is between two particular atoms that's clearly polar, but if that bond is part of a larger molecule, I can create a situation where that bond is no longer polar but ionic. So it has to do a lot with the whole structure and not with individual bonds. But we're going to simplify it down to almost an extreme and absurd degree here. Okay? So remember, what I'm explaining to you now is just an introduction to uh, trying to understand this process of this, this idea we call polarity. But when you get to college and take a college class, they're going to add more stuff in there to give you a butter, much bigger picture, a more complete picture of what electronegativity really is and how you figure out when something's electronegative enough to be polar or nonpolar or ionic. That make sense? Yes? No. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, good. All right. So the, the numbers that were given in the previous video, the crash course video on polarity, uh, he used the uh, electronegativity difference of 0 0.5 and 1.6. Okay? Now those numbers that he mentioned in that video were electronegativity difference. 
Okay, so it's the once you subtract one electrode negativity from the other, and you're going to put the larger one on the top. Okay, you're always going to get a, a positive number. You're never going to get negative numbers here. Okay, then you're getting an electronegativity difference. Now, if the electronegativity difference is less than this 0.5, then these bonds, the bonds, not the electronegativity difference um, for the overall molecule, but just for the bonds, the bonds are considered nonpolar when the difference is uh, less than 0.5. Okay? And if we're between 0.5 and 1.6, then these bonds are considered polar. And then if the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.6, then in a general sense, these kinds of bonds are assumed to be ionic. Okay? And there are some ionic bonds or bonds that would be ionic just using electronegativity that if you put it in a certain kind of molecule would not be ionic at all or would be um, very somewhere between maybe ionic and polar. The fact is, while we call these things nonpolar, polar, non-ionic, it's, it's really more of a whole rainbow of things. Okay? It's not really absolutely nonpolar and absolutely ionic, but it's kind of like you start on this end where you've got like two oxygens bonded to each other. Well, those have exactly the same electronegativity. That would be clearly nonpolar. But after you get any two atoms that are different bonded together in any kind of molecule, you start moving up the scale. Okay? So when we say it's nonpolar or polar, that's a relative term. Got it? We're just going to use these 0.5 and 1.6 because it's convenient for us. Okay? Make sense? All right. So let's look at what they were talking about in the video uh, quite a lot. And that was a crash course video on polarity. And let's look at water. Now, when we were figuring out the, f the three dimensional shape of water, we started with this thing called um, the electron dot formulas. Okay? And then, with the, starting with the electron dot formulas, we showed a sharing arrangement. So we shared electrons in order to get oxygen, in this case, to have eight valence electrons and octet and hydrogen to have two electrons, which is all it wants to be full and stable in its valence level. Then once we get that sharing arrangement, we went to the Lewis dot formula, where we sort of squeezed those shared electrons in between the element symbols. And then we did a Lewis uh, formula, where sh shared pairs of electrons and only shared pairs are replaced with lines. But you have to keep the lone pair on there where there are lone pairs. These are all two-dimensional drawings when, when, in fact, this is a three-dimensional molecule. To show the three-dimensional shape, we go through uh, a di a, another set of um, type of drawings. Okay, We do first what I call an electron pair shape. And you go back here to this Lewis dot formula. You see you've got one, two, three, four sets of electrons around this central atom or the atom we're interested in figuring out the shape. And if you have four sets of electrons around a, an atom of interest, that's going to form a tetrahedral every time because that's the arrangement and angles that gets those electron pairs as far apart as possible, which ties into this thing called VASIFER, valence shell electron pair repulsion. And the reason those pairs of electrons arrange themselves in this tetrahedral is because they want to be as far apart as they can be. Okay, you can only get two electrons in an orbital, and you can only do that because uh, opposite spins um, cancel out the electromagnetic repulsion, but those pairs of electrons repel each other because light charges repel each other. Remember all that? A whole bunch of stuff we've been doing over several units all sort of piling in here together in one big thing, right? That's why chemistry is so... One, one example of why chemistry is so... Um, it builds on itself, okay? Why it builds on itself so much. You've got to have all the previous stuff to understand the stuff we're getting into now. All right, so we're going to put our electron dots or electron sets on the end of our, our arms or bond angles. And then, so this is called a tetrahedral electron pair shape. I'm not going to label the names of it, but you need to know this is a tetrahedral. That's the 3D geometry. And then the type of drawing is, is showing an electron pair shape. Okay, the type of structure is an electron pair shape. The next step then is, is to replace two sets of electrons with the hydrogens uh, because 
two sets of electrons are shared. Okay, we're going to replace two sets of electrons with the symbol for hydrogen because two of these four sets are shared. But you've got to keep all of the angles exactly the same as before. Okay, so I call this a modified electron pair shape. And its 3D geometry is still tetrahedral. Okay, so the type of structure here we're drawing is a modified electron pair shape. But the 3D geometry description is tetrahedral. Then the last step in figuring out the three-dimensional shape of this molecule is to draw exactly the same thing again without the lone pairs. So this is no longer tetrahedral now here on the end. This last drawing is not tetrahedral because we're missing those two arms over here. The name of this three-dimensional shape is bent. Okay, really high-end technical name, bent. And it's a molecular shape. So this is a bent molecular shape. Okay, we've done all this before. This is previous stuff we're reviewing. But you've got to be able to do this to figure out if the molecule is polar. Okay, before we even get to polarity and the, whether the molecule is polar, we've got to get to this first. Okay, now to know if the molecule is polar, to know if the molecule is polar, you've got to ask two questions and you've got to be able to answer uh, affirmatively to both. Okay, um, the first question is, are the bonds polar? Okay, if that answer is yes, that's not enough to know you have a polar molecule. You've got to answer yes to both, both questions. The first question is, are the bonds polar? And the second question in the video, it was referred to as, asymmetry, okay, is the molecule asymmetrical? Okay, if you can answer the question yes to both of these and correctly, then you have a polar molecule. If you don't, don't answer yes to both, either both of them are no or even one, one or the other is no, then you don't have a polar molecule, okay? Yes. So the top left one, that's the sharing arrangement, right? This is sharing arrangement. Sharing arrangement. It started out as Lewis dot. The red part is a sharing arrangement. I'm mean, no, sorry. It started out as electron dot. Then the red part makes it the sharing arrangement. Okay, then Lewis dot. Lewis dot. This is called the Lewis formula. Okay, Lewis, formula. Lewis dot formula, Lewis formula. And then that's like the um, electron pair shape. Electron pair shape. Then modified electron, modified electron pair shape. Okay. Molecular shape. Now, once again, we're simplifying this down to an almost absurd degree, okay? But it's the beginning place to understanding polarity, okay? Now, so <clears throat> what we have to do is figure out, for question number one, are the bonds polar? We need to do some subtraction because we need to know the electronegativity difference. We need to know the electronegativity of each atom in the bond. And for that, you look on your periodic table that has all the electronegativities, Okay, so find the electronegativity for oxygen. Find on your table, your reference table, the electronegativity for oxygen. And the electronegativity for oxygen is 3.44. And the electronegativity for hydrogen is 2.1. And if we're going to find the difference, the electronegativity difference for a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, we subtract. That's what a difference is. 1.34. But if you're using all the rules I've taught you in here, starting with unit 1, we have an empty slot here, so we need to round off that digit. 
and we really get an electronegativity difference of 1.3. Okay, that's kind of a finer point. Doesn't really change a whole lot because either way, 1.3 or 1.34, this is in this polar range. You see that? So we know that the answer to the first question is yes. The bonds are polar. Got it? What we need to know now is, is this an asymmetrical arrangement? Now we've talked about this a good bit in here. We said that it's difficult for high school students to think in three dimensions. Okay? That the way that you've been taught to think of symmetry, you just got to have this two sides looking exactly the same. And in that being the case, we could split this molecule right here, and it looks symmetrical, wouldn't it? But in fact, in three dimensions, that'd be two-dimensional symmetry. Okay, like you're two-dimensionally symmetrical. Roughly speaking, we slice you down the middle from head to your, you know, through your navel. All right? You're, you're about the same on both sides, right? You're, sy you're symmetrical, aren't you? Two-dimensionally. But you're not three-dimensionally symmetrical. This molecule has the bonds with the hydrogens all kind of piled up on one side of that oxygen. And that's not three-dimensional symmetry. That's not sym symmetrical. That's asymmetrical. Okay? Got that? So our bonds, uh, the, the molecule is asymmetrical. Got that? Yes? One way to think about this is this. We can say asymmetry for uh, molecules can be thought of this way. An uneven spread of bonds to surrounding atoms. Anybody here a hunter? Anybody here a hunter? No hunters? You're a hunter? Okay. So if you're shooting, you're a hunter? So if you're shooting dove, okay, we're in the south here, a lot of people go hunting, right? If you're shooting dove, you want the, the shot coming out of the end of your shotgun to have an even spread. Does that make sense? Right? You don't want it all bunched up in the center and a few things kind of spread out here. You want an even spread so that when it gets where the bird is, you have the highest possible chance of actually bringing the bird down, right? Okay? That's kind of what we're talking about. We're an even spread here. Okay? Coming out from this central atom or the atom we're interested in. Now, even this is a bit too simplified. Okay? Because really, it's not an uneven spread of bonds. It's an uneven spread of polarity. Okay? So it's an uneven spread of polarity in the bonds that we're really talking about. We'll get to that later on. Okay? You with me? For right now, we can think of it as just bonds, but we're going to tweak that a little bit later in this lesson to talk about an uneven spread of polarity in those bonds. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. All right. We'll, we'll find out if you know what I'm talking about when we get there. All right. So we've got an uneven spread of bonds because there's not an equal spacing around this, at, this oxygen of the same kind of bonds all the way around. Does that make sense? No? Or yes? I don't see any heads going up and down or side to side. I can't tell, guys. I don't read your minds. Help me out. Do you understand? It's asymmetrical. So we have a polar molecule. Now, there are ways to represent polarity. Um, if I'm looking at just a bond between hydrogen and oxygen, because oxygen has a significantly higher electronegativity, I can show this bond being polar in this fashion. So this end over here means that this hydrogen has a much lower, a significantly lower electronegativity than the oxygen does. So that what's happening is the oxygen is actually pulling the electrons it shares with this hydrogen, pulling it over on this side. So the, the electrons shared between oxygen and hydrogen are living over here more than living over here. Okay? Kind of like what happens in a divorce. You know, the kids live with mom or dad, right? Sort of, kind of, right? Okay, you can't spend the night in the same, two houses at the same time. Yes? Yeah. Okay, thank you. God, i got somebody answering you. Wow, okay. So the electrons are being pulled this way. You can think of it like a tug of war. 
Okay, and tug of war a lot of times you tie a knot in the middle of the rope, you hang a flag from that knot in the middle, you got the two teams fighting over it, right? Pulling against each other. And this team that's stronger usually pulls the flag to their side. Well, the electrons of the flag being pulled over here toward the oxygen. Okay, so this oxygen then in this bond is more negative overall than the hydrogen is because the electrons are over here more of the time. Yes? Exactly. Okay, so the question was, uh, do the electrons always go toward the atom with the higher electronegativity? The, yes, the answer is yes. That's what I was trying to explain. Yes, okay. So in our water molecule, then if we were to draw that with these bonds in there, then we're going to have our electrons flowing, you might say, in that direction toward the oxygen and flowing from this hydrogen toward the oxygen. And so the, uh, the electrons are spending way more time here than they are out here where the two hydrogens are at any time. So on the whole, then, this side of the molecule is partially negative. This Greek lowercase letter delta just means partially something, and the negative means partially negative. Okay, the electrons are negatively charged. If they're over here more often than they're up here, then this end of the molecule that has them more, more often, that's partially negative. And over here, it's partially positive. Okay? So whichever parent this is over here has got the greater percentage of visitation for the kids. Does that make sense? Can you draw that bigger? Bigger than what? Can you draw one that symbol bigger? Why would you want to draw it bigger? That's what it looks like. It's just a, you mean the delta symbol? Yeah. Delta. It's kind of like a capital S where you kind of close up the bottom end of it. Okay? Or a super simplified version of a gourd. You know what a gourd is? Okay. All right. So this is representing the polarity in just the bond. And in this case, this end of the, the bond is partially, um, partially negative, and this end of the bond is partially positive. Okay? But here we're looking at the molecule overall. Now, how can we say the molecule is partially negative on this right-hand side or sort of lower right over here? Well, that's because you can think of it like um, a flow of a river, for example, okay? It's like the water is flowing here and here, and so this end is where all those, the water is going to be going, right? Well, the electrons are over here, so this side overall is going to have more electrons slash water, and this side up here is going to be dry. Does that make sense? No? Yes? Okay. How many of you know what a tugboat is? You know what a tugboat is? Okay. Um, tugboats, if you think about tugboats operating on water, that's a two-dimensional arrangement. Okay? And it's easy to think in two dimensions, we said, and harder to think in three dimensions. Let's imagine we have a, uh, a big ship coming into harbor. Okay? Well, it's really hard to maneuver in the tight spaces of a harbor. So here's our big ship. looking at it from the top down, and that's just kind of a simple representation of a big ship, okay? And we need to move it along in the harbor this way. Well, you don't put a tugboat back here in the back. You put a tugboat over here on the side. Okay, so it's pushing in this direction. But if I just have one tugboat, which direction is that boat going to go? Huh? To the right. Okay, so what I have really is you're going to have another tugboat over here pushing in that direction. Okay, does that make sense? It's a little little boat with a big motor that pushes the big ships around the harbor because you can, it's more maneuverable that way. Oh, okay. Some of these big uh, cargo ships and oil container ships and things are so big, they have to cut the engines off 30 miles before they get to the harbor and just keeps right on going because of the momentum, okay? Well, you know, in a harbor where the space is kind of tight, you get a tugboat out there to move the ship around in these small spaces, okay? All right, and which direction is the ship going to go if this tugboat and this tugboat are pushing with the same, with the same energy, with the same force? Yeah, kind of straight this way, okay? That makes sense? 
Well, you kind of think of it this way. If you're pushing this way and push this way, which way is everything going? This way. Does that make sense? So overall then, let me show you this. In the same way then, if our oxygen is here, and I put the two hydrogens over here, so that I represent the direction there, the electrons or the whole thing is being pushed like a tugboat, okay, then overall, the molecule is polar in this direction. Does that make sense? So the molecule overall is partially negative on this end and partially positive on this end. You got that? Now it's a little more difficult when you're thinking in three dimensions. Okay? Now if you take an art, you know, and you have to think in three dimensions, it might help you. If you're a big science fiction fan and think about space tugs, wow, now you're really ahead. Space tugs. If you've got a really large space ship and you're bringing it into a tight space like maybe um, the space station in, 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 on Earth's orbit, right? Okay? Or a really large space station. Okay? Um, it's kind of like the harbor. You need a little bitty tug to push it around and get it where you don't want it to go. Like a tugboat, but only three, but in three dimensions. Because in space, you're not going just side to side, but you're going up and down too. Right? Okay? Right now, spaceships aren't that big. And they have these little tiny jets to move the, the spaceship around to get it to line up with the space shuttle just right. If they don't line up with the space shuttle just right, they punch a hole in the space shuttle and everybody dies. Say what? All right. I hope you remember the formula for ammonia. Does everybody remember the formula for ammonia? You're supposed to know the formula for ammonia. Somebody say NH squared? That's ammonium. Ammonium is NH4 plus. Ammonia is NH... That's the NH2 is an amine when it's on a carbon chain or an amide if it's an ion. What is ammonia? NH3. Thank you very much. All right. Figure out the three-dimensional shape of ammonia, please. Figure out the three-dimensional shape of ammonia, please. Determine if it's symmetrical or asymmetrical and whether the bonds are polar. Okay, and then figure out if the overall molecule is polar. All right, using the rules I just gave you. And you can work with a neighbor, okay? Find a learning partner to work with and compare notes, all right? If you've done everything the way that I've taught you, step by step, then you should have an ammonia molecule that looks like this. Okay? Of course, you might have taken off one of the other arms. Your lone pair might have been on one of the other arms. But it ends up being this uh, trigonal pyramidal shape. Okay? Now, um, this is a crutch. It's not a definition of three-dimensional sym symmetry and asymmetry, but it's a crutch. Okay? If you can't look at it and see that it's asymmetrical, here's a crutch for you. Okay? It's kind of like training wheels. Got it? Yeah. All right. If, as you go between... The um, let me find the drawing we did a while ago. You have to go between the um, modified electron pair shape and the molecular shape. If you have to remove electron pairs to get the molecular shape, your molecular shape is going to be asymmetrical. Got that? If you have to remove electron pairs between this modified electron pair shape and the electron pair shape then your molecular shape is going to be asymmetrical. The d actual definition of polar means that there's an uneven um, density of electrons. Okay? It means that the electrons are spending more of their time in one place than another. So that that end with the, that place where the electrons are spending more time is more negative than the place where they are spending less time. That's the general definition of polarity. However, in terms of how we figure out whether a bond is permanently polar or not, if the electronegativity difference is greater than 0.5, we consider that to be, po well, greater than 0.5 and less than 1.6, we consider that to be polar. Yes? Sure. So like stage four would be symmetrical. 
Hold on, we'll get to CH4. Okay. Okay? All right. Now, if you calculated the electronegativity difference correctly, you should have gotten an electronegativity difference for these nitrogen to hydrogen bonds of 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is greater than 0.5, less than 1.6. So that means that this bond is going to be polar. Okay? That triangle set of dots means therefore. Okay? All right, this just means the clear implication is, therefore, that this is a polar bond. Okay, just kind of symbology. All right, so the nitrogen is more polar, more electronegative. If you did the math correctly, you should know the nitrogen has a uh, higher electronegativity number. Okay, it's more electronegative. So the uh, electrons are spending more of their time over here where the nitrogen is. Okay. Does that make sense, what I just did? All right. So now we're getting into three dimensions. We can't look at it two-dimensionally. You've got to think three-dimensionally. So these are not like tugboats in a harbor on the planet Earth, these are like tug spaceships pushing around a really giant spaceship to a space station in space. Okay? But they're all pushing in a kind of upward direction. So that if I push something in this direction and one in this direction and one coming back up toward you in that direction, which is this dotted line with the arrow on the end, the whole thing's going to kind of go that way, right? That makes sense? All right. Uh, and, and if you think, if you're good at thinking in three dimensions, that's great. I mean, athletes sometimes are really good at thinking in three dimensions, okay? But not all of them are, okay? Um, but that means that the overall molecule, let me draw that out again here like we did previously. The overall molecule, here's our nitrogen up here. Here's the hydrogen over here. There's the hydrogen coming out toward you. The hydrogen going back behind the paper. Okay, so overall, the molecule is going to be polar in that direction. This end of the molecule on the top up here then is partially negative. This end down here at the bottom is partially positive. Okay, the bond between hydrogen and nitrogen is polar. Each individual bond is polar. Okay? And because the bonds are all kind of pushing upward, then it makes the molecule polar. Yep. Will you explain the, uh, the delta thing again? Means partially whatever follows it. Partially. Okay? So delta. The, the lowercase letter delta in this context, the lowercase letter delta in this context, where did I draw that out before? I put it aside somewhere. Here it is. Means partially. Okay? Now, completely negative would be like an anion with a one negative charge, or a two negative charge, or a three negative charge. If it's completely if it's completely pulled the electrons away from something and they and you stuck an extra electron on something, that's a completely charged particle. Partially charged just means it's not completely pulling the electron away, but it's kind of holding on to them more tightly. They're spending more time over there. Yeah, I see what you're asking. Let's see if I can do it with some pins here, okay? Let's take our three bonds, okay? Here's our three bonds for the hydrogen going to the nitrogen, okay? They're like this angle right here. All right, now if I am pushing on an object right at the intersection of all these things, one, one pushing this way, okay? One pushing this way, sort of toward you, 
and one pushing this way. They're all pushing on this object right here at the center. Which way is this object at the center going to go? Straight up. There you go. Got it? Oh, so the lines are just showing where the force must be. Is it force? Or well, it's not really force here. It's charge we're talking about. Okay. It's partially, partially, neg partially positive and negative charge because of the density of electrons. No, it doesn't move anywhere because it's a charge. It's not a force pushing on it. There's no work being performed on that nitrogen. Okay? What's the importance of Well, in the video we watched before this, vi this video we're recording here, the one from Crash Course on Polarity, it showed how water molecules are attracted to each other. So, water molecules are attracted to each other very strongly. If you have water and oil together, oil is not very strongly attracted to itself or to water. So the water attracts to itself and pushes away the oil. There's a term for that. It's called hydrophobic. You need to know that term. Hydrophobic. If something doesn't like water, it's hydrophobic. Oils and gasoline are hydrophobic. They don't mix well with water. They separate. Okay. I'm sure, yeah, there's, there, yeah. I'm, I'm sure I haven't seen that, but I'm sure there's a lot of those. Okay. Now, look, guys. Shh. There are molecules that are polar molecules. Polar molecules, and for that matter, ionic particles, because they're charged, like water. Okay? So, where's my water illustration here? What do I do with it? Okay, here's our water. This water molecule is very polar. Okay? Here's our water molecule, very polar. All right? So charged particles, like ionic compounds, like water, because they're the negative end and the positive end for the positive and negative ions to be attracted to. That's why salt, table salt, dissolves in water. Okay? Polar molecules, other polar molecules, like water, because they also have partially negative and positive ends to attract to each other. That's why you can dissolve sugar in water. Okay? Because sugar is polar. What? When is, when is vent, ever be <coughs> vent is never going to be symmetrical, okay. but it can be nonpolar. <coughs> All right. I could do that, but it wouldn't give you the whole picture. Do you want part of a picture or half or half a picture of the whole picture? If you watch a movie, do you only want to watch the left half or the right half, or you want to watch the whole movie? Okay, well, you need to just, okay, just stop and think and let it soak in a little bit, okay? Honestly, you can do this. Well, good. I'm not going to give you stuff to memorize that is more limited than understanding the broader theory. Okay, yep. No, because you all, in order for it to be a polar molecule, you have to have both polar bonds and an asymmetry of the polarity. Okay? So it has to be polar bonds, but, and the bonds have to be unevenly arranged in a way that creates this uneven density of electrons. That is to say, uneven density means you have more electrons grouped up in one place than in another. Oh, because there are more electrons on the nitrogen, the hydrogen. Yes, so the electron density is higher up here because the electrons are being pulled up there. And the electron density down here is lower because they're being pulled away from here. Huh? Starting to make sense. Starting to make sense. Good. Good. All right, now, so somebody asked me about methane. Who asked me about methane? You asked me about methane, right? Let's find the three dimensional shape of methane. And see if we can figure out what's going on with it. How do you know? Y'all got that already? Or y'all need to draw it out? Do you know the shape of a, of a uh, methane molecule? Methane is CH4. 
Got, all right, everybody, if you can't write down your head, know the, already know the three-dimensional shape of methane, draw it out. Do the steps and figure it out. Is that what you got? Good. Is it a symmetrical molecule? Okay. The bonds are all equally spaced. It's the same kind of bond all the way around. So it doesn't matter whether the bonds are polar or not. You can't have a polar molecule unless you have both polar bonds and an asymmetry of that molecule. Okay? Now here's an even better example of this. This is carbon tetrachloride. Now, carbon tetrachloride, the, are the bonds between chlorine and carbon polar or nonpolar? Greater than 0.5, less than 1.6. Okay, very much a polar bond. Okay, it's a polar bond. All right? But the molecule is symmetrical. So the chlorine is far more electronegative than the carbon is, significantly more. So the electrons are being pulled away from the carbon and toward the chlorines. Okay? But they're pulling in, in such a way that the overall effect on the outside of this whole thing is nil. If you think about these as space tugs, okay, remember tugboats in three dimensions, spaceships that are tugboats of a sort, okay, they're like pulling on this big spaceship right here in a way that it doesn't move. They're just ripping a spaceship apart. That makes sense? No? Yes. Okay. It, I mean, it, the carbon's not going to rip apart, but the point is that it doesn't do anything overall, I mean, as far as the polarity is concerned, okay? So the molecule is not polar. Even though you have polar bonds, the molecule is not polar because this is a symmetrical molecule. All right, you got that? Non-polar molecule, polar bonds. Here's methanol. All right, we looked at a methane, and we decided it was what? Polar or nonpolar? Nonpolar. Now, if we did the math, we'd find out the electronegativity difference between a carbon to hydrogen bond is about 0 0.5, so it's right on that break point, okay? So this end of the methanol molecule is nonpolar. This end of the methanol molecule, that's that OH group. Well, let's go back and look at water a minute here. That water molecule, remember, was polar. So the, the electronegativity difference but in the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is 1.34. There's a lot of electronegativity difference over here, and this end of the molecule is asymmetrical. Let's look at that. Here's our carbon. Here's our carbon to oxygen bond. Um... The hydrogen would be bonded in a, using this as one of the angles, would be a tetrahedral over here. Okay, so that's pretty well evenly spaced around this carbon, because that's a tetrahedral around that carbon. This oxygen over here has a couple of lone pairs. So this end of the molecule is bent, and this is a bit much more electronegative element than either the carbon or the hydrogen. So this end is asymmetrical. This end is symmetrical. This end of the molecule is nonpolar because for the most part, the bonds are pretty close to being nonpolar anyway. But even if they are polar, it's pretty much a symmetrical end of the molecule. Okay, This end is asymmetrical, and you've got a much greater amount of electronegativity difference over here. So this end of the molecule is polar. Hybrid molecule. Okay. Hybrid molecule. All right. The dipole refers to the fact that I have two poles. Here's a pole. There's a pole. Okay. It's like a magnet. A pole here and a pole there. North side and south side or south and north. Whatever. Okay. So any polar molecule 
has a permanent dipole. Any polar molecule has a permanent dipole. Now, if this is a hybrid molecule, what's going to happen if I put that in water? What's going to happen if I put that in water? Huh? Well, no, it's not going to break up. It's going to stick together. It's going to turn into where the polar part is in the water and the polar part is on top. I hope y'all are listening. Right? She nailed it. <laughs> Water's polar. This end of the molecule is polar. This end of the po molecule is nonpolar. This end of the molecule is going to dissolve in the water, and this end isn't. But it's not going to split up. Well, it dissolves in the water anyway because this end sort of pulls in the water. Okay, that makes sense? So this is doing all the work to dissolve it in water. What happens if I dissolve this in oil? Huh? This end dissolves in the oil, and this end doesn't. So it dissolves in both oil and water. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Now, it's not as much of a problem as it used to be, but it used to be we had a lot of problem with getting water in your gas tank. Anybody have water in the gas tank before? No. Okay. They've, the government has required that the underground tanks they store gasoline in at gas stations be a much better quality than they used to be. It used to be they, you get leaks and the gas would flow out and get in the groundwater, the groundwater would get in the gas tanks, and when the gas tank in the ground gets low, the water would start to go up through the pump and get in your gas tank. Okay, and your car would sputter and cut out and, you know, you get stuck on the side of the road somewhere. Okay? If you ever get water in your gas tank, it does occasionally happen because every time they open up the top to that underground gas tank to put more gas in there, you're letting in moisture from the air. And that builds up. So if the tank in the ground ever gets low enough, the gas, the water that's on the floating on the top of the gasoline gets in your gas tank. Okay, if that ever happens, the way you fix that, huh? Put alcohol in your gas tank. Just a little bit of alcohol will take the water, dissolve with the water, dissolve with the gasoline, mix it all together. Go to the go to the grocery store and buy 90% ounce isopropyl alcohol. Okay. All right. You can go to the auto parts store and buy some expensive stuff. Doesn't do any better job than isopropyl alcohol. And that's a lot, a lot less expensive. You can use ethanol. That's the alcohol you drink. But you can buy, it's a lot less expensive and easier to get hold of if you're underage. And you are. Yeah. To buy isopropyl alcohol from the grocery store or the drug store. Okay. I don't recommend you buy alcohol that you drink, period, okay? All right. Look at this molecule and look at this molecule, okay? Think about what we're just talking about, the theory here. Which one of these two molecules overall is, has the greater polarity? This molecule on the right or this molecule on the left? Which one has the greater polarity overall? You see the left has a greater polarity? Why would that be? Because there's a bunch of non-polars over there, and I think it's somehow they counteract it. Okay. That, that's, that's a very reasonable and logical and correct analysis. Okay. Since the non-polar stuff over here is so big, and the polar stuff is just one little thing on the end, overall, this molecule is less polar than this one is. There's a balance going on. Okay. The universe is all balanced out. The OH bond is very highly polar. Which is more polar, the OH bond or the NH bond? Which is more polar, the OH bond or the NH bond? Which is more polar, the OH bond or the NH bond? Huh? OH. Why? Right. The electronegativity that we calculated for OH, the electronegativity difference is 1.3. What was the electronegativity, electronegativity difference we calculated, or I told you about, for the NH bond? 0.9. OH has a much higher electronegativity difference than NH. So, which one of these two molecules would be have the greater polarity? The 
bottom is more pole than the top one? The top is more pole than the bottom? I got a polarity of, opi of, of opinion here. How many people think the top? How many think the bottom? This is a much more polar end than this one is because the difference in electronegativity is greater here than here, and this end on both of them is nonpolar, right? Does that change your opinion, Tanner? All right, guys, you got to stop. You got to think. Okay, you can't just, you know, chat about other things, Katie. All right, you got to think this through. You got to let the movie run in your head. Okay, this is a far more polar bond between oxygen and hydrogen than the nitrogen and hydrogen bond. Why is that? Because we calculated the electronegativity difference. We said the electronegativity difference between nitrogen and hydrogen is 0.9, and the one between oxygen and hydrogen was 1.3. Oh, okay. Now that's just math. In reality, it's because the oxygen is more electronegative. And I won't get into all the reasons why. It way goes, you know, a little bit far beyond we need to go. Yes. What's one that's one point six? I don't know right this minute. Okay. All right, Taylor. Sure. Which one of these is more polar? The top one. Top one. You're convinced now. Yes. Tanner, are you convinced? Yes. All right. <coughs> what? Oh, well, I know you're paying attention, but you you're the one that said that the, originally this was more. Yeah, you, you had it backwards a while ago, and I'm just trying to make sure that I have made it clear to you, okay? Which one of these two molecules is more polar? Why? Two OH groups, okay? So the, even though I have a, roughly the same number of atoms, or groupings anyway, on both of these, the one on the top has more of the polar ends, would make it more polar overall, okay? Does that make sense? All right. Okay. Um, now, on the test, you don't have access to electronegativity numbers. Okay? That's on the homework references, but on the test, you're only going to have a regular periodic table with uh, no electronegativities. So let's look at that periodic table that has the electronegativities for a minute, and you familiarize yourself with the pattern. Yep. All right, remember when we looked at electronegativity difference or electronegativities when we're doing periodic table properties, that was unit two. We're now in four. We said that this end of the periodic table has the lowest electronegativity, and up here in this corner, except for the noble gases, this has the highest. And so the pattern is as you go in this direction, not 45 degrees down, but this direction, that you get a lower electronegativity and the highest is up here. And if you look at the pattern in here, because if we're looking at polarity, we're only looking at covalent compounds. And covalent compounds almost exclusively involve just the nonmetals. That's only 15 elements. So all you got to know is the pattern that exists in this sort of triangle right here. Does that make sense? You don't, mem you don't have to even memorize the numbers. You have to know generally, okay? As I go from fluorine to oxygen and nitrogen to carbon, they're going down in about steps of 0.5. You agree? Yeah. Okay? If I go down this column, <coughs> excuse me, they're going down in steps of oh, about 0.8 in the beginning and then 0.8 and then a little bit less than that. But pretty, you know, pretty good steps going this way. And smaller steps going in this direction. So you can estimate the difference in electronegativity and still figure out if a molecule is polar or not without having the actual numbers to work with. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, without looking at this periodic table then, turn to your regular periodic table. Turn to your regular test electron, uh, periodic table. <clears throat> if I have uh, phosphorus bonded with oxygen, would that be a polar bond? If I have phosphorus bonded with oxygen, would that be a polar bond? No. 
Okay? Phosphorus and oxygen. Is that a polar bond? No. No. Why? You don't think it's great enough? Yeah. Let's go check. Let's go ahead and check. Phosphorus and oxygen. Okay? That's a pretty good jump right there, isn't it? All right? Let's go back. <clears throat> How about a bond between nitrogen and chlorine? Nitrogen and chlorine. Polar or nonpolar? Polar. You think? Well, let's go back and look. Nitrogen is three, almost dead three, and chlorine is right at three, okay? But that's still nonpolar, okay? So those are the patterns that you need to spend some time familiarizing yourself with tonight. All right, so let's take a look at just a few more things here in terms of polarity and how it fits into um, the case where there's more than two kinds of atoms in a molecule. Let's look at this one right here. Um, in this case, then, we have a very highly uh, polar bond between the hydrogen and the nitrogen. Uh, this was about 0.9 electronegativity difference. And the electronegativity difference between nitrogen and oxygen is, you know, slightly less than 0.5, but it's right at that, okay? So we definitely have a polar bond going this way and an almost completely polar bond going there. Well, because everything is actually, let's just make this kind of a dotted line, okay? Because it's really close to being polar. We're just going to show it's not quite polar. But notice, everything's headed to the right, okay? So overall, this clearly polar bond and this almost to the point of being polar bond, they feed on each other. The result is the overall molecule has a dipole moment, and it's a polar molecule. All right, let's take a look at this one now. Here, the electronegativity for chlorine is 3.16. Electronegativity, 3.16. The electronegativity for sulfur is 2.58. Electronegativity of bromine is 2.96. Okay. So between here and here, we clearly have a polar bond. Okay that's headed, uh, but it's headed this way. That is to say that this is a greater electronegativity this way and a greater electronegativity this way. So we have a bond that's more electronegative in this direction and a bond over here that is more electronegative in this direction. Okay? Um, and actually that's not a completely polar bond according to the rules we were using where 0.5 electronegativity difference is uh, what's required for a polar bond. But the point is that this one is sort of pulling electrons in one direction and the other. They're kind of canceling each other out. The result is that whatever this difference is, and let's calculate that right quick. So we've got uh, 2.96. Oh, I'm going to do minus here, not plus minus uh, 2.58. So we have an electronegativity difference here, E, N, D, of 0 0.38. On this side over here, we have an electronegativity difference, let's see, 3.16 minus 2.58. That's uh, 0 0.58. So this is an END of 0 0.58. So whatever amount of polarity there is to the left here is sort of counteracted here by the electronegativity difference going to the right. The result is that even though we have a polar bond over here, the uh, opposite polarity in this direction, or the opposite dipole moment, I suppose, is not completely polar, cancels it out because of pulling in opposite directions. So overall, this molecule is nonpolar. Okay? So here we have a reinforcing of the polarity. Here we have a counteracting of the polarity. That makes this clearly a polar molecule overall. This makes this a nonpolar molecule overall. Now, here, 
we have um, a almost completely polar bond between the hydrogen and the uh, carbon. This is right at close to 0 0.5. It's not really quite to the range we want to call polar yet, in, at least in this class. Okay. So there's our electronegativity difference for, the, for there. The electronegativity difference between carbon and oxygen is very clearly polar. Carbon's electronegativity is 2.55, oxygen is 3.44. So we've got a 0.89. Very clearly a polar bond going in this direction. Okay. So now these polarities, even though this isn't going in exactly the same direction, they're kind of feeding to each other. This is, if you combine the polarity of these two bonds here, the result of vector addition, which we don't cover in high school in this state anyway, this vector addition actually has the overall direction of the polarity, the combination of the dipole moments for both of those uh, two bonds going in that direction. So overall, this these two polar bonds, because the electronegativity is greater here, is feeding into and supporting and increasing the overall polarity of the molecule going in this direction. So this is, has an overall dipole moment in that direction. This is a polar molecule. Let's take a look at something called hydrogen bonding for a minute. Anytime uh, you have hydrogen bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, the polarity and the size of the atoms combined create a special condition so that you have uh, a possibility of uh, a kind of polarity that is so intense and so unique that the resulting attraction between two molecules is more than simply a polar attraction. Partially positive, partially negative things attracting to each other. And partly into covalent bonding. You're not quite a covalent bond and not quite simply a polar attraction. And this is called hydrogen bonding. The conditions required is you have oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine bonded to a hydrogen, and that allows for these long pairs sitting out there and a hydrogen where the electrons are being stripped off of it, you know, because those electrons are being pulled toward the oxygen so strongly, this hydrogen is almost devoid of any electrons which means I've got an almost pure proton, almost, not quite, but almost a pure proton sitting out here. So now we have what's called a hydrogen bond. And that's a very strong polar attraction, sort of dipping just slightly into covalent bonding. And it's very, very strong. This is what uh, ties one water molecule to the next. It's what makes water um, have such a high boiling point and freezing point as compared to other molecules of the same size because water molecules are so strongly attracted to each other. Water molecules are so strongly attracted to each other that if you put something in water that is nonpolar, the water molecules are going to pull to themselves and push out anything that's not polar. It's like putting oil and water together. They're, they don't, they don't uh, attract to each other. And we often think about uh, water pushing out the oil, we call it hydrophobic. When something doesn't like water, it's called hydrophobic, and oils are considered hydrophobic. That makes it sound like that water doesn't like the oil, or the oil doesn't like the water. Let's back it up. Makes it sounds like the oil doesn't like the water. In fact, it's the water that doesn't like the oil. That's a better way of explaining it. Something that's hydrophilic, hydrophilic is attracted to water. So ionic compounds. Sodium has a positive charge. Chlorine has a negative charge. Sodium chloride, the salt. This positive sodium ion is attracted to a water molecule that has a partially negative end on the water end. And down here where the partially positive end is located, well, the chlorine is attracted to that end. So water molecules will dissolve salts, any kind of ionic compound almost, to some degree, a greater degree or a lesser degree. Okay, it's also why water molecules will attract and dissolve anything that's polar, like ammonia. Uh, 